Good evening to the opening skeptics of the year. It's a long march to May, uh, but let's get started. Tonight, I'm really pleased to have uh, a former student here, along with his entourage, a few other students from the class of 85, the great guys, and his wife, Amelia, the class of 85. Chris Wolf uh, was a wonderful student here, and he was a, a great guy, a nice person, still a nice guy. He works for Merrill Lynch in the, fi in the financial district, and he was there during the 9-11 events, and he has a story to tell. Last year at the salt, one of the softball games, he sat, stood with me behind the cage, and he said, I don't think your students know all that much about 9-11. And I said, you're probably right. So here he is, let's welcome him, uh, Chris Wolf, class of 85. So again, as I said, what I'd like to do tonight is um, I'm going to tell my story, um, but before I do, I want to kind of feed you with a little bit of facts, not lecture you, but just feed you with a little bit of facts. Some facts I wasn't even aware of until I sort of looked them up, um, but I think it's pretty extraordinary. I think it's pretty good knowledge to know, and there's going to be a short, about four and a half minute video that sort of... Um, encapsulates the facts of the day. It, it doesn't necessarily talk about the emotions, um, although I do hope that when you see the video and you look, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's very brief, but if you look and you look, at the pic you look at the faces of New Yorkers, New Yorkers, the toughest people in the world, right? Look at the faces and look at the reactions of the people that were there on that day. So for those of you who don't know, um, this was the big and beautiful World Trade Center located in the heart of the financial district in downtown Manhattan. Um, I'll get to where I was in a little bit, but this skyscraper, I was born in 1967. I think the World Trade Center was erected in 73, I think, 72, 73. So this has always been um, part of the New York City skyscraper for as long as I can remember. <clears throat> this was the worst attack in the history of the United States. It was the first attack on the mainland of the United States. 
We were attacked on December 7, 1941, at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, which was not part of the mainland United States. Still, we did lose 2,403 people. They were almost all service people, and that was the instigator, if you will, for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to get us into World War II. This is something I didn't know. The terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001 are the single most documented event in human history. September 11th, 2001. A day of grief. A day of courage. This is how that day unfolded. My daughter called me. She said uh, a plane just flew into the World Trade Center. Nah, you gotta be kidding me. It's gotta get Piper Cup or some clown was flying down the river. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, with 92 aboard, traveling at a speed of 470 miles per hour, strikes the north tower of the World Trade Center complex. Within minutes, officials coordinate the citywide emergency response. Their base of operations is a state-of-the-art command center located on the 23rd floor of 7 World Trade Center. With one tower in flames, the tragedy is only beginning. It is 9.03 when United Airlines Flight 175, with 65 aboard, traveling at the speed of 590 miles per hour, smashes into the south tower of the World Trade Center. This aircraft strikes the corner of the south tower. It rips a diagonally shaped gash from the 84th to the 78th floors. The South Tower lasts only 56 minutes before it succumbs at 9.59 a.m. The dust cloud billows outward for blocks. Victims stagger away. At 10.28, the television mast atop the North Tower spears straight down. Once the collapse started, there really wasn't any way to stop it. It was just going to go all the way down once it got started. Chaos in New York City. down in Lower Manhattan. Phone lines jammed with more than 230 million calls. Hundreds of firefighters trapped in the towers. Hundreds more raced to the scene. Falling debris from the collapse of the North and South Towers ignites fires in the neighboring buildings of the World Trade Center. World Trade 4, 5, and 6 are ablaze. World Trade 7, the building housing the city's command center, burns unchecked for seven hours. At 5.20, it collapses. The city's emergency nerve center is destroyed. Somewhere in that time, and it's very hard to keep track of time during this, they had been ordered to evacuate number seven by the Port Authority. To this day, we don't know who gave that order, but whoever it was saved a lot of people's lives. With New York a war zone, some residents walk across the Brooklyn Bridge to get out of the city. Others seek escape in vessels piloted by the Army Corps of Engineers. At 7.45 p.m., the New York Police Department says 78 officers are missing, 
and estimates that 200 firefighters are dead. At 10.56 p.m., police officials say they believe there are victims alive in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Working with urban search and rescue teams, there was a lot of areas to be searched underneath the debris field. There were voids that had to be searched for possible live people. September 11th, 2001, the longest and most tragic day in New York's history is drawing to a close. The airplanes, <clears throat> specifically as it relates to the World Trade Center, were two Boeing 767s, very large planes with long flights, leaving from either Newark or Boston, heading to California. So the hijackers knew what they were getting. They were large planes, heavily fueled. The weight with the passengers and luggage per flight was 157 tons. The fuel on the load was 16,700 gallons, roughly 116,000 pounds of jet fuel. Highly flammable. The impacts, the structural damage, the impacts, in addition to severing several load-bearing columns within the towers, ignited over 10,000 gallons of jet fuel, plus office contents. The jet fuel from the impacts traveled down at least one elevator shaft, this is the North Tower, and exploded on the 78th floor and made its way all the way down to the North Tower main lobby. The results of the fires devoured everything inside. The towers, the workstations, the furniture, the paper, the walls, the carpet, and the people. Both towers became virtually 110 story chimneys, with heat reaching as close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to melt steel.
The steel that melted caused the columns, which you'll see when I show you later, caused the columns and the floors to literally sag and collapse underneath the wall. The final fires, I didn't even know this, the final fires were extinguished at the World Trade Center complex site exactly 100 days after the attacks, December 20. <clears throat> Who were the hijackers? Who were the hijackers and why would they do this? The hijackers in the, time, in the September 11th attacks were 19 men affiliated with, I'm sure you've all heard of now, Al-Qaeda. 19, uh, sorry, 15 of the 19 were citizens from um, Saudi Arabia, two were from the UAE, and one was from Lebanon. I hope that you've all heard of this person. Osama bin Laden was responsible, he was the head of the Al-Qaeda, he was responsible for the attacks at the towers of 9-11, at the Pentagon. He was the extremist who planned everything. The irony is, and I was discussing this with Dr. Miller, is that Osama bin Laden was Saudi Arabian, wealthy, Western educated. So why? Why would they do it? The answer simply is, I don't know. Um, I had the unique opportunity to speak to Dr. Miller about this. And he told me that because we had the United States, that is, we had a presence in Saudi Arabia, which, if you know, Mecca, which is the holiest of places for the Muslim faith, is in Saudi Arabia, that Al-Qaeda did not like that. They were extremists like the world had never seen before. So their justification was to kill as many United States citizens and anyone who was involved in, again, the greatest tragedy in United States history. Before I begin my story, it's just, I, my wife and I were, were driving up together and we were talking about this and um, is there anyone older than 45 in this room? Okay. What, 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 was, what did your parents, what did they tell you? What was the biggest tragedy of the day? What, what do they remember the most? The assassination of President John F. Kennedy. That's what I grew up on. That was the worst day in American history. Um, with all due respect to President Kennedy, and it, it certainly was tragic, um, I think this day eclipses that immensely. So, just to give you guys a viewpoint of exactly where I was, um, my wife and I, Amelia, we lived in Summit, New Jersey. We both worked, we worked a block away from each other. Um, we used to drive to Jersey City, park our car, and take the PATH train from Exchange Place into the World Trade Center every day, just like hundreds of thousands of other people. So if you can see from the arrow, my office is right there, the World Trade Center is right there. So it would take us about, what, not even seven minutes to walk, but that was sort of through meandering streets. So as the crow flies, it was roughly 1,500 feet away from the World Trade Center. This is a view from the South Tower of the World Trade Center, the first tower, the second tower to be hit, the first tower to go down. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see clearly, the arrow points to this building right here. And I was on the second to top floor of that building. Um, my office, my, I was an equities trader, so the trading floor was in the middle and all around the perimeter was all glass offices. So we could see for miles around. Um, in particular, we could see a real close shot of the World Trade Center. I mean, I cannot tell you 
how massive those buildings were. I mean, these videos and these pictures, uh, they almost don't do it justice. So I remember <clears throat> having coffee with the convertible bond trader uh, shortly, I think it was roughly quarter of nine, and I remember looking outside and seeing papers floating everywhere. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Yankees ticker tape parades. It reminded me a lot of that. And I was like, what's going on? So I got up from my desk and everybody was oblivious to what was going on because the markets opened at 9.30 and I was supposed to be working. Instead, I was having coffee with a friend. I was ready to go. So I looked around and I went into one of my portfolio manager's offices and I looked around and I looked immediately on the street to see if there was a fire of some sort, something that was coming up, something that was causing the debris to come up. And I looked around, I looked around, and I couldn't see anything. And then I looked up, and I looked at the World Trade Center, and I saw, not fire, but I saw a small hole with smoke billowing out. And you have to understand that the first tower that was hit was hit from the north side. I was south of the World Trade Center. So what I was looking at was the small hole that was poked through there. And I remember screaming, holy, the World Trade Center's on fire. And all 65 traders, both equity and bond traders, all ran to every single window that you can find to get a view. So at the time, a financial news network called CNBC, uh, Ron and Sana, I think, has a Sana door here? Yeah. So I was actually watching Mr. and Sana that day. Um, and we had actually seen it before it was reported on the news. So the first thing that, that my boss did, as I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this, but when you're an equity trader, when you do what I do, you have direct links to firms. So you press a button, there's Goldman Sachs. You press a button, there's J.P. Morgan. So my boss, having seen that it hit the North Tower where Cantor Fitzgerald, another Wall Street firm who we were clients of, he hit the button to ask Eric, what, what's going on? What happened? The line was dead. This is the view from when the plane hit on the other side. So we, all of us, all the traders were standing around discussing this. And at the time, just like in the video, they said, man, it was probably just a small <coughs> hyper cub or something like that that flew in uh, to the World Trade Center because the hole looked so small because the, map, the buildings were so massive. I cannot amplify that. So as we're standing around, again, you can see the arrow. That's my building there. I remember distinctly talking to a friend, saying like, wow, man, this is really crazy. I, I, I guess we're not going to be working today, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye something, and it was black. And I was like, this is strange. And then I found this picture, and even though it was an absolutely crystal clear day, probably 58 degrees, could not have asked for a nicer day. This plane jutted out of nowhere and slammed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I saw it live. Everyone that I was with, particularly the women, screamed. And we instantly knew it was a terrorist attack. Again, it was broadcast live on television for all to see. After the plane hit, there was some time. There was some downtime. We're all sitting around talking. We didn't know what to do. They told us to sit tight, do not move. So we did. So I got a call from somebody that said the New York Stock Exchange evacuated for the first time in over a hundred years. Well, I had a lot of friends that worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and I knew that they would all be 
standing outside drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes. So I went to see my buddies, and I walked out, and my office was even closer to the New York Stock Exchange than the World Trade Center. I walked out about a block and a half, and I heard, I have still to this day a difficult time describing the sound of what I heard. But all I remember was people running towards me, screaming, a third plane hit, a third plane hit, while the noise of the South Tower was coming down. And I say this not mockingly, but I say it would be like the hand of God crushing seven freight trains. It was so loud and so piercing. Something that is indescribable. So just like these people, I turned and I ran. I was fortunate enough that I was close enough to my office. As the people were running past me, I was close enough. I didn't see the smoke. I ran into my building, hit the elevator, went back up to the 25th floor. By the time the elevator doors opened, and I mean the 25th floor, everything was pitch black. It was all smoke. It was all dust. It was all soot. And I was one of the fortunate ones because I was inside. There were a lot of people, if you YouTube it, there were a lot of people That's a picture of Lower Manhattan after the first tower hit. You can see how it virtually encompassed everything. Now, I worked on the east side. The World Trade Center was on the west side. And I remember distinctly that the, ends, the winds were blowing from west to east that day. Another thing. This is the reality. Over 200 people either fell or jumped to their deaths on that day. Yet, interestingly, none of them were ruled a suicide. Now, I remember several months later when I was sitting down with my dad, and he was like, God, why would people jump to their death? I just, I, I don't understand it. I can't get my head around it. Upon further investigation, as I told you, not only was the heat so extreme, but they were dealing with massive amounts of smoke and massive amounts of toxic air because of the plastic, the workstations, the computers, the carpeting, the ceiling tiles. Above or below, it all was a mix. I, I, I wanted to show this video, but I, I, I don't want to run too long, but there's a video of literally people hanging out of the windows just trying to grasp for air. Now, this next image is the last image I'll show you of someone falling. This actually was um, famous. Uh, it was taken by an AP photographer, and it was on the cover of Time Magazine and in the New York Times. It is entitled The Falling Man. There's a documentary about the photographer who took this picture, and he didn't realize what he took when he saw it. There are several images of this man falling, still yet to be unidentified, although it is rumored that they believed he worked on, on the top restaurant of the windows of the world. But what's interesting about what the photographer said in this picture is, here's a picture of a person literally dying, yet there's no blood, there's no gore, there's no sign of anything. You just know his impending doom. 110 stories. So we waited and we waited, and then we wondered what would happen to the second tower. Well, this is what happened to the second tower. And the same thing, this time I didn't go out. So again, the same thing, massive amounts of smoke. After the smoke had cleared, I couldn't even use our cell, we couldn't even use our cell phones because at the time, it's not like iPhones today. Back in 2001, we did have cell phones, we did use them, they were very important, but it's not nearly like the technology today. And as the video said, over 250 million calls were placed 
all at the same time. So I had literally no use of my cell phone. So when Mayor Giuliani at 12.30 ordered the evacuation south of 14th Street, he just said, get out. Didn't tell us how, but he just said, get out. So we left. The only way that I could call Amelia because my cell phone didn't work was, remember those direct dials? So I hit JP Morgan, I got my counterpart on the phone, and I said, get my wife on the phone. We screamed over to her, she worked on the trading floor, and we coordinated that we would meet on the corner of water and wall at exactly quarter to one. She, me, and two other work associates traveled north, up the Lower East Side. It took us three hours to go from Water Street, Wall Street, to 32nd Street. If you know anything about the geography of Manhattan, it doesn't take three hours to, to walk that, that long. There were, as depicted in this picture, although this picture I believe is the either the Brooklyn or the Manhattan Bridge, there were so many people that we were, we were almost literally shuffling to get to where we had to go. And the one thing I said to Dr. Miller um, that really stuck out as um, a memory of anger um, was as we were walking north, we were walking through the Lower East Side, and there was some um, bodegas, just some like crappy deli, and they had the television set on. And we were kind of walking, and no one was saying anything to anyone. We were just silently sort of shuffling. And I remember looking, and I remember seeing people dancing in the streets in Israel, Palestinians, celebrating the death and destruction of the World Trade Center. And I remember feeling such rage, but I also remember feeling so defeated that nowhere, in my, certainly not in my lifetime, in any time that I can remember in the United States history, that was the country so attacked and dejected. How has the world changed since? Coming to the end, guys, I promise. We have been at war in Afghanistan for, Dr. Miller, help me out, 17 years. We were in war in Iraq. 6,251 soldiers lost their lives. Over 45,000 were wounded. A new big government agency was created called Homeland Security. The Patriot Act was passed bipartisanly, which gave the government huge surveillance powers. That means they could tap your phone, anybody's phone. I'm not saying they did, but I'm just saying it was out there. And last but not least, kids, this is the world that we all live in now. The creation of something called the TSA has changed air travel forever. Before 9-11, and I forgot about this, only 5% of bags were all checked. And IDs were not even checked. You literally sort of haphazardly threw your bag and then you walked through a metal detector. Now, even today, I have seen senior citizens get frisked and so, anyway, that's, these are just four examples. I, I, could, I, I, I could continue, um, but again, I don't want to take too much of your time because I know we're, we're running a little bit over here. Um, but this is the last slide, is that out of the darkness comes light. And here we have the Freedom Tower, which stands to this day. From what I understand, it is close to being 100% populated. Thing. But either way, it stands, in my opinion, as a beacon of what this country stands for. Rising out from the fire and creating something beautiful and long lasting. Thank you very much.
said that the other burnt buildings near it were also built, burnt down. Did any of them get rebuilt as something new, or? Yes. Were they, okay. As a matter of fact, um, the World Trade Center complex of today, which also right next to it is something called the World Financial Center, which was also destroyed. Um, that was almost the heart of Wall Street. And it's a very different place from when I worked there and when Mary worked there. Uh, it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, of, not only is this tower, um, I mean, <laughs> you want to talk about the work they put into this tower. Um, the sad thing is, is that if you go downtown, almost everything is like a fortress. Everybody required, is required to show ID. There are pillars around that trucks, delivery trucks can't get near the place. But yes, to answer your question, um, everything was rebuilt. As a matter of fact, I believe it took roughly seven months to completely clear and clean all of downtown Manhattan. And I don't just mean just the, the rubble of the World Trade Center, but as far east as my building, I mean, I remember, because we were home for the whole week, they, they shut down the market for the entire week. Um, so I also want to add, um, I forgot to add to this, uh, this is a question I get asked a lot. Um, I lost eight people that day. Uh, people that I worked with, um, friends, people I had dinner with often. Um, so, Anyway, I think about them often. And uh, there you go. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Jersey City and take the path train into the World Trade Center. Well, there was no World Trade Center and there was no path train. And literally hundreds of thousands of people traveled. That's the way that they got to downtown was through the path trains through the World Trade Center. So with that off the table, I, I mean, I'm not making this up. It's, it's actually kind of funny. Um, New York City put it together sort of with, with, with rope and, and string and mirrors, um, they actually got whaling vessels from all the way up in Massachusetts and Maine, and they came all the way down. And guys like me who were wearing suits, women, you know, nicely dressed, working a, you know, high, relatively high paying job, and we're literally, I'm trying to find my balance as I'm getting onto this whaling vessel, and it was, it was literally like this. So that's how we, <clears throat> that's how we commuted to work for um, over a year. And then finally New York City got smart, the Port Authority got smart, and they built these, um, which still exist today, these high-speed ferry terminals, which are, which are beautiful. And now, of course, today, if you go down to uh, where, the, where the memorial is, the path station is, I don't know if any of you guys have been down there, but it's quite a sight to see. It really, really is quite a sight to see. And by the way, um, another interesting note that um, someone told me is that the World Trade Center Memorial is the single most visited tourist site in all of New York City. Everybody's fast, everybody's tough. Um, 
nobody was speaking that day. You know, it was just, it was just, everybody was in such shock. So, to answer your question, Mr. Sykes, when we got back, wasn't that following Monday? I think it was that following Monday. Um, so, as I described, we, we went into, on these uh, fishing vessels, whaling vessels, quite literally, and the stench just walking from Battery Park to my office was still in the air. You could still smell the burning plastic and metal. Um, getting into our offices, we all knew what the markets were going to do, and they did what they did, which was completely collapsed, because the United States economy, I don't know if any of you are economics majors here or anything like that, um, the United States economy, despite China growing and everything like that, when we sneeze, the world catches a cold. So we should have called it one big cold that day, and it affected the financial markets for year and a half, two years. To answer your question in terms of the feeling, hard to describe. Um, I will say that we were all alive, so that was a good feeling, um, and we were all hopeful. But every single one of us in our office lost it. Every single one of us, and we were almost our own group counselors. If you will. But it was Wall Street, and I had a job. To So, um, you know, just imagine a scenario, if you will. Today, let's say 9-11 never even existed. Because you have to remember, 9-11 didn't exist. Nothing had ever come close. So, for example, um, I, I, I bet I can ask a lot of the people here. If you're traveling on an airplane today, okay, today, and you have people that are hijacking your plane, are you going to let them do it? I'm not. I don't care if I lose my life. Back then, people had hijacked planes before in the past, but it was always like, okay, fly me to Yemen or give me some money or whatever it is. That's why the fourth and final plane that crashed, they got wind from loved ones through cell phone connections what had happened to the previous three planes, and they rushed the cockpit. So in terms of when we knew or how we knew it was a terrorist attack, as I said before, it was an absolutely crystal clear day, beautiful day, 58 degrees, and you could see for miles and miles. So the first plane, we still didn't know it was a jetliner. We still we saw the fire build and build and build, but I think it was I think it was roughly what was it, 15, 16 minutes or something before the second plane hit, and then come on. What are the odds of one plane hitting the World Trade Center, which I don't think has ever happened, or maybe it happened once, I don't think so. But two, 15 minutes apart, boom, terrorist attack. Yes, sir? Um, here's kind of a question, but do you think uh, uh, it was a good idea for George Bush to declare war on uh, like Al Qaeda and this, like terrorists. Well, um, you know, I told Dr. Miller this. Um, I, you know, I'm really not here to discuss politics. Um, this country has become so politicized. So I, I'm not going to answer your question, but I, I, I believe that whoever was in office, whether it was a Democrat or a Republican um, would have had, I don't know, if the exact same response, <clears throat> but a pretty simple one. So, I mean, again, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I, I don't want to get political, um, but I would, I would hope to believe that the leader of our country would have taken whatever, man, woman, uh, Democrat, Republican, would have taken some action. What were the actions taken by President Bush at that time, good in my opinion, bad in my opinion,
it doesn't matter. Do you think that people were afraid of like a third attack afterwards because there was so much like chaos that they So, great question. Um, one of those things where you say, how has the world changed? Every single time there is something that happens almost immediately, at least I do, think it's a terrorist attack. There was, it was, my wife is talking to Mrs. Long. When was it? There, there, was a, there was a plane crash about six, seven months, right? After 9-11. Had nothing to do with terrorism at all. It was, it was yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a malfunction. And it had crashed and, and exploded and people lost their lives. Immediately, everybody rushed to judgment and was like, it's another terrorist attack. It's another terrorist attack. So uh, there was also there was the anthrax scare too, and and then all of a sudden people started over politicizing things and started saying like, well, it's, it's the Muslims and, and, and it's this and it's that and, and they're out to get us and um, well you know they are out to get us. I mean ISIS still exists to this day. It's an offshoot of, of Al Qaeda. But yes, to answer your question, um, everybody lived in fear. And one of the reasons why when I asked Dr. Miller to speak is I wanted to make this as real to you as it was to me. Now you all weren't there. Probably the majority in this room weren't even born. But I'll tell you, when somebody mentions September 11, 2001, I hope, I really hope dear in your hearts that you can think of it as the type of day that it was for We good? Good. Good Thank you very much.